So in this video, I'm going to go through code window design. Now I've done a video like this in the past. However, I've made a few changes to my primary coding window. So I just wanted to do another one. Now, this video is going to go probably a little bit longer. It's going to be more conversational. So hopefully you can learn something from this and let's get started. So I think code window design is far more difficult to accomplish. A well, good code window design is far more difficult to accomplish than output window design and that the code window, you've got toggle buttons, you've got label buttons, code buttons, activation links, deactivation links, um, exclusive links, scripting, all these different factors that are interacting with each other to try and get the most information as efficiently as possible. Whereas with an output window, other than the aesthetic design of things, like if you want to include graphs or something like that, there's only really toggle buttons or um, inactive buttons that are involved. Whereas yeah, in a code window, you've got all these different aspects. So makes the whole creation process a little bit more difficult. So obviously with my code window, what I try and accomplish is get as much information as possible as efficiently as possible, but also doing it as efficiently as possible in terms of code window size. So this is the size of my code window. It kind of fits like nicely into the corner of my um, laptop screen here. So that leaves all this room here for a video. I've always found it odd if you have a code window that's, you know, like this big, and then you only have a small little video, it kind of defeats the point of having a code window at all when you can't even see what you're coding. So I try and keep mine as small as possible. I'm going to extend it out, however, just to show you everything that's going on. So this is kind of like my main coding face here. So this is where, like, this is what you'd be looking at during a basketball game. Then I've got what I would just call the off-screen buttons, labels, those sorts of things. Then I've got the substitution matrix over here to the right. We'll get to that later. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is the thing that I always have in every single one of my windows, whether it be a code window or an output window, which are these home team and away team buttons here. So these are inactive buttons, and these determine the scripting and the color of all the other buttons on the window. So if I just go here and go, say, Ohio State, make them red, and I go... Michigan and I'll just leave them the dark blue that they are and I go execute a lot of the colors will change on the window along with a lot of the names so if you see here we've got a high state turnover high state steal high state block foul if you look over here and you look on the gray bar at the bottom of the screen you can see the real name of the button so we've got Michigan made two Michigan missed two missed three made three Michigan offensive rebound Michigan defensive rebound then we've got a higher state offense and a higher state defense. Now the scripting for all of these buttons I just showed you is basically the same thing. And then I'm identifying the button ID. So home team, that's the button ID of a higher state up here. And then I'm adding the word offense to it. And then I'm renaming it a higher state offense. So if I were to change that to say Iowa, it would be Iowa offense. It's kind of that simple sort of scripting concept. Same for these buttons down here, except I'm just using away team. Away team plus made two. So basically Michigan made two. If I was going to change that to say Maryland, it would be Maryland made two. So that makes this window super ad super adaptable for whatever team that I want to code with. So I can use the same window for Ohio State or Texas or Purdue, North Carolina. Whatever team that I'm coding for, I can just use the same code window. Now there's a lot of complex things going on. If I was to show you the links for this code window, I mean it's a bit of a disaster. I can't obviously diagnose every single one of these links and tell you what is going on with every single one of them. So I'm just gonna basically talk in more broad concepts. So going back to the main coding phase, as I said at the start of this video, the most important thing to me is capturing as much information as efficiently as possible. And for the individual players, that's basically capturing all their made and missed shots, their rebounds, assists, steals, turnovers. On offense, then on defense, you've got things like block, steal, um, defensive foul, defensive rebound. So the way you do that is when I click offense, or one is it is hotkeyed. I'm going to get all my offensive labels. Then when I click defense, I'm going to get all my defensive labels. And again, it's just using that same space to, for both kind of buttons. Now, if I just look at one thing here, for example, the foul, it's basically if offense button state equals one. So if the button offense down here, which is the button ID of this word offense, if the state equals one, state equals one, meaning if it is pushed down, state equals zero means it's not pushed down. So if it's state equals one, rename offensive foul, if it's not pushed down, rename nothing at all. If button defense state equals one, rename defensive foul. So it's basically using that same button for two different labels. 
and I do that for the other ones on the same sort of player toggle box. Now, where we'll get to shooting now, the shooting is probably the most complex part of this code window in that there's a lot going on with the different shooting label kind of mechanisms that are going on in the background. Now, if you saw the previous iteration of this desired video, you would have seen me talk about the, um, the shooting matrix and that there was a series of toggle buttons, links, and scripting that essentially meant that every time I wanted to add shot labels, uh, whether that be the shot type, the shot location, or the shot quality, there was a very intricate balance and kind of dance that was going on in the background that would activate all these labels through different triggers to get all that information in all the different instances that I could. And essentially I feel really stupid now in hindsight in that there was a far easier way of doing it that it just involves basically labels and code buttons as well as links. So now instead of having toggle buttons involved at all what I've essentially got is when I'm on offense and I'll just put my I'll put some players over here as well. So when I'm on offense, I've got my four label, uh, shot results, made two, miss two, made three, miss three. And those are gonna use activation links to activate a button that is behind this made code button. If I just move this, you can see there's a code button that mimics this code button here. Again, that's just using the scripting and the button ID. It's just identifying that button name and just renaming itself to whatever this button on the front is showing. So I've got activation links from made two, miss two, made three, miss three to this button behind. When I click that, it's going to activate that button. What it's also going to do is activate the player that shot that particular result. So for example, it's going to activate this Washington button down here. And if you look in the bottom gray bar, you'll see that the button group is shot player. So it's putting that information not only in that player instance, but also in this offense instance. So it's saying the player who took the shot was Washington. It's also gonna activate this made two label here. Now, if I just press it again, you'll see these activate. You'll see the Washington and the made two label activate, and it's putting those two labels in both this player instance and this position instance, as well as there's a high state made two. Again, using an activation link just from this label, it's activating all three of these buttons and putting those two labels in all three of them. Now that these three instances are now open, whatever labels I click, as long as they're not exclusively linked, are gonna go into these three buttons. So that basically has opened up the, like the book on what sort of labels I can put. So now I can put whatever shot type I want. I could put one shot type, I could put two shot types. So I could say it's a catch and shoot three breakaway or it's a post up with a hook shot. It's a catch and shoot two, that's like a floater. Now I just tend to, in my own, um, coding just to activate one different type of shot type just to keep things basic but you've got that option to activate multiple shot types now so I could just put off the dribble. Now that off the dribble label has gone into the player instance, the position instance as well as this Ohio State made two instance and I've got the shot quality uncontested or contested. I'm just going to go with contested and then I could put the location. So now again I just have to press which location I'm gonna put. And again, this is gonna trigger, like my previous iteration of this code window, a bunch of events, except the only event it's gonna trigger is it's gonna use a series of deactivation links. If you look at all these deactivation links, they're all coming from the location chart. It's basically gonna deactivate all the code buttons that are currently active, except for this position one. So it's gonna deactivate this player instance as well as this Ohio State made two instance. So I'm just gonna put right elbow, it turns those instances off. But again, because I'm using labels, I've put before deactivations. So this label has gone into those two instances as well before they've turned off. And now that I've closed all these instance, uh, instances, I've got the shot player, the shot result, the shot type, the shot quality, and the shot location in the player instance, the position instance, and this team instance, very simply, very efficiently, not using any toggle buttons, just using a complex web of essentially activation links and labels. Carrying on pass shooting, we've got these in, uh, the opposition instances. Um, we've got the made and missed shots, the rebounds, foul, turnover block, and we'll get to free throws later. But we've got the opposition information below the players. And again, I haven't written the entire name of the button out. I've just used the show function, show show made two so I don't have to write down or have showing a high, uh, Michigan made two, I just got made two. 
and I'll get to the play soon. I'll just go, I've got these tags that are labels, the defense, which are labels, and the length, which are labels, that all go into these two possession instances to again add another layer of data to each position. Now with these plays, again, this is another aspect of using the space efficiently to keep the window small. Instead of having a whole bunch of plays just flow all over my window, I've essentially grouped all these plays into one little spot using packs. Now if I just click pack one, it's going to show pack one, pack two, and pack three. So I've essentially only got eight buttons, but I can also get through these packs 24 different labels. How does that work? Well, if I go into the scripting, and I write down here, say, horns, sloppy, and flow. I go into a code mode. Now when I press pack one, it's gonna show horns. Pack two, it's gonna show sloppy. Pack three, it's gonna show flow. And again, it's just using the button IDs from these buttons, pack one, pack two, pack three. And it's basically like we said saw before, if there's pack equals one, show it rename horns. If it equals two, rename sloppy. And if it equals three, rename flow. So using one button, we've got three different play labels. Now the reason pick and roll is highlighted and it doesn't change in the middle is because pick and roll is obviously a very important play in basketball. So I wanted to add more information to that play and made it make it a more central aspect of the code window. So say I'm on offense and I press pick and roll. Essentially, the pick and roll button will now be surrounded by labels that are the names of the players that are currently in the game. So I've got the Washington, Aaron, Sewing, Young, Liddell, and then those same players mimicked on the other side. Now, if you look down below on this gray bar, you'll see that the label groups here are Handler and Roller. And what these are doing is essentially it's adding the name of the player who's handling the ball in the pick and roll and the roller of the pick and roll into this position instance. So again, when I use output windows, I can then filter positions by who was rolling, who was handling, and I could like measure that up with who shot the shot, what sort of shot type it was, what was the shot quality, where did the shot look come from in the location chart. And again, it's putting all that information in as efficiently as possible using the same space as I was before, just using these exact same play buttons, but now using names instead of plays. So I can put like Washington was the handler, Liddell was the roller, roller. it's going to go back to my plays, and I can say, you know, it was a made three, catch and shoot, uncontested from the left corner, and I have all that information now in my main position instance. So it's again just labeling that information on top of each other. Now the last thing I'll talk about in this design video is the free throws. Now free throws are the most complicated and by far the most annoying things in basketball code window design, and that like every single time a free throw is taken, there's so many different variables onto what could happen afterwards. You could have, you could have um, like a made shot, sorry, a made free throw, a missed free throw, then a foul, then a rebound, then a defensive rebound, an offensive rebound. You could make both free throws, you could miss both free throws. So it gets so complicated for all these different variations of what could happen possibly after free throws. So the way I've done it basically is when I have these two free throw buttons, the opposition is pretty simple. I click free throws. I've got how many they made of how many attempts. Then if there's a defensive rebound from the home team, I just have to click the player that did it. If there's an offensive rebound from the um, from the away team that took the free throws, I just have to click offensive rebound as that is right there. And if they just make both their free throws, I just have to click the free throw button and everything will go away. With the home team, it's a little, a little bit more complicated. So I've got, essentially got the same thing. I've got how many free throws they made of how many attempts but those are also intersected with the defensive rebound of the opposition and the offensive rebound of our team now the reason they're in this weird order and you have to press them in the order reading up to down is because these are trying to label the previous position instance and you can't create a new instance otherwise you're just creating an instance for the sake of doing free throws and that's not really a position in itself so i've got to essentially add these labels to the previous instance without creating a new instance which kind of intercepts that label information. Now that might sound confusing, but trust me, sports code is one of those annoying things where you've got to work around these little quirks, and this is one of them. So for example, say Aaron's is making free throws. He makes one, but he's got to miss the second one, or he's missed the second one, so I click defensive rebound. You can see that label activated, and that's got to activate against the position that was previously open. Then I click off how many attempts. 
and you'll notice on this big matrix down here, a lot's going to go. And then I click, and then I click two. It's all done. Everything goes back to normal, and we keep coding the game. So it's a very complicated system again of toggle buttons, activation links, deactivation links, exclusive links. It all kind of works out, and the free throws are obviously a very important part of the game in terms of the final score, how well a player like draws fouls, all those other aspects. So you kind of got to get them. Another example um, it could be that you've just got the one free throw, so but you're going to get an offensive rebound. So say Aaron's makes the free throw, there's an offensive rebound opportunity. Liddell gets the offensive rebound. You click that, everything activates. You go back to your main offensive labels and you keep on coding. So again, it's just one of those variations that I've tried to work around using a complex system of links, and we kind of get there at the end. So that's all I've got for this uh, design code window, or code window design video. If you have any questions, my email will be in the description below. And if you do have questions, just feel free to reach out and we can talk about all these different aspects in sports code. And I'll be happy to talk about it as I'm a bit of a sports code nerd, as you can probably tell. And I love talking about this stuff. Thank you very much and thanks for watching.